Thank you. Thanks very much. My name is Tim Allen. Um, I, I teach at the London School of Economics. I can see even some of my students here, which is very nice to see. Um, and I've been working in northern Uganda for more years than I like to remember, actually. I think I started working out there in 1980. Um, and a year or so ago, I was in Matt's seat being interviewed about um, a book that I'd written on the International Criminal Court's intervention. And this is Matthew Green, who uh, was Reuters correspondent in East Africa, who now works for the Financial Times in West Africa. And he's written this extraordinarily interesting book um, about his search for Joseph Kony. Um, so maybe we'll just start off maybe asking you, you know, what made you decide to work on this topic, sitting there in a comfortable Nairobi office? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't actually that comfortable, but yeah, <laughs> it's a nice office. Um, I think I was covering East Africa for Reuters, um, sitting in the Nairobi Bureau. It's almost like a crow's nest. Uh, you're looking at the sweep of the region. You've got Somalia up in the north, Tanzania in the south, the Comoros Islands, Uganda, Rwanda. There's basically 15 countries that fall into your remit. Um, and there was something about what was happening in northern Uganda that was really the most mysterious of all. Um, you had this situation where a rebel leader was leading a, an army of guerrillas, many of whom were abducted uh, young people, children. Uh, and the standard report was, well, he wants to rule Uganda according to the Ten Commandments. Um, now, for a long time, that was what we'd write in our Reuters reports almost without questioning it. And I think after a while, I thought, well, hang on, you know, something about this doesn't quite add up. You know, there's got to be more to it than, than just one lunatic uh, with an army of child soldiers. Um, so I thought I'd take some time out and, and go and see if I could find out the other dimensions to it. And so how did you go about doing that? I mean, how, how did you begin your journey? Well, it, in a way, I, I started out in, in many respects without much hope of success, um, partly because when I started the project, um, the International Criminal Court had just issued arrest warrants for, or for Joseph Kony, the leader of the LRA, and four of his most senior commanders, um, only three of whom are now alive now. Um, but it, it seemed like it, it would be the worst possible moment to look for somebody who'd just been uh, made essentially Africa's <laughs> most wanted man. Um, so I really started out without a great plan in mind. Uh, I went up to Gulu, which is the main town in the north. Was that the first time you'd been to Gulu? I, no, I'd actually... I, I remember so, so sitting there sometimes consuming Reuters news briefings and so on. Oh, absolutely. But were you just doing it in Nairobi? You'd never been there before. Well, no, I, I'd actually been for a total of about four days. Oh. <laughs> so well, I, that's I, in depth I, for a lot that, of journalists. For Reuters, that yeah, would be in depth. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, OK, right. Um, okay. No, yeah. you're quite right. I, I, I was a, a newcomer to, right. to northern Uganda. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things I found very disturbing about northern Uganda is how there's a kind of echo speech in Gulu. You arrive in Gulu town, it's almost like a kind of disaster tourism center. And journalists go there and they talk to each other and they talk to NGOs and they, they're given a certain kind of perspective. Was that, was that your experience too? How did you break out of that? Well, I think that's very true. And as a journalist turning up there for a couple of days, it's almost inevitable that you, you always do the same. I mean, there's almost, it is a disaster tourism route. You know, the first stop is normally one of the rehabilitation centers for former child soldiers who Pabo, escaped. But usually Pabo. It, it, Was it Pabo? No, there's, well, there's a couple in Gulu town well, itself. Well, or Pit, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, nearby. They're always the same ones, yeah. You turn up and they dutifully wheel out some very forlorn figures yeah. who've recently escaped from the Lord's Resistance Army and they, they tell you the same stories about terrible atrocities that they've had to commit. Um, but it doesn't actually tell you how this thing can go on for so long. Uh, and I think the key to it is just spending a bit more time there uh, yeah. and, and having the chance to build relationships with people um, and former members of the LRA who actually begin to give you a different story after you've known them for a few months than they would do when you're just sort of sticking a microphone in their face for, for half an hour. So how did you get from Gulu into southern Sudan looking for the LRA? Well, I, the reason I, I went up to southern Sudan is for, for a long time the LRA has had camps in the south of Sudan. They've been sponsored by the government in Khartoum. Uh, and I heard that there was a peace, uh, that, that there was a sort of beginnings of a peace initiative taking place in the south of Sudan. There was, um, uh, there, there was sort of rumors going around that some of the top LRA commanders had actually met 
southern Sudanese officials. And it seemed like, well, you know, this is a sort of dream opportunity. I mean, until this moment, it seemed like a totally opaque movement. Suddenly there was this sense that actually, you know, may, maybe they're going to make contact with the outside world. So I decided that I needed to kind of hot foot it up to Juba. Did you find as you got to know more about the LRA and, the, and the, this ex the extraordinary movement that seemed to be associated with all these spiritual values, did it come to make sense to you? Did you begin to feel that there was some kind of rationality behind it? I think, yeah, I, I think absolutely. The, the, what was striking is that it is portrayed and, and, and very much almost understandably, understandably in a way it's portrayed as a sort of fundamentally irrational organization we always have that same headline about ten commandments uh, and, and joseph kenny saying he wants to he's a, a self-styled prophet a mystic who, who talks to the holy spirit um, and in fairness to journalists all of that is at some level true um, but it tends to give us a sort of knee-jerk reaction where we feel that all oh, they're obviously completely crazy um, and again uh, but, but the, the sort of, I suppose what came to me as I spent time talking particularly to the former LRA members was that in their own universe, they do see it as a, a very rational organization. They have objectives, which is to overthrow the government, which they feel is persecuting the people in northern Uganda. Um, and they, when they commit atrocities, although you never condone what they do, and you never, uh, to, to sort of try to understand is obviously not to excuse. At the same time, the, the violence they commit follows a pattern, it has an objective. So they are actually highly organized, highly disciplined, and in their own terms, rational. What's the objective of the violence? Well, I think the, the overarching strategy that they have, um, and, and, and the, the horrific part of the strategy, is that they want to deny, that they want to make sure that the people of northern Uganda do not support the government because they, well, the LRA itself began as a sort of resistance movement against the government of President Museveni, who, who came into power in 1986. Um, but as, as the years passed, because the great bulk of the Acholi community in northern Uganda failed to rise up in support of Joseph Kony, he increasingly felt betrayed by them and would start essentially to punish them, to try to control them. Um, at the same time, the government of Uganda's response was to put people essentially into camps uh, to try to deprive the rebels of support. It's the kind of classic drain the lake to catch the fish counterinsurgency strategy to drain away that rural base of support. Um, so the rebels responded by mutilating people, um, chop, you know, uh, giving sort of orders for them to move away from army posts. Um, so any time that, the, any time that they perceived the people were not doing what they wanted them to do, or, f or, or veering towards supporting the army, they would punish them. So what was the significance of all the spirituality then, in your opinion? Why was there all this talk about being possessed, speaking in voices? Why did that seem so significant to so many people? Well, I think the, the interesting point about this question is I'm almost aware that I can't answer it, because spending time in northern Uganda and confronted with the reality of these beliefs, you do realize the gulf culturally in a way that, that, that you come from as, a, as an outsider and it's actually very hard to, to really answer that question. Um, I suppose one thing that happened that really brought home to me the sort of strength of, of the belief in what we, what we would refer to as spirits, the, the spiritual universe. Um, I was in a, a remote camp um, in the north where one of these ID uh, camps for, for um, internally displaced people, as they're known, who'd been sort of forced by the army to stay in these camps. So I went round and I found a hut where one of the traditional healers was staying um, and taking clients, as it were. And I, I went inside this sort of darkened room, and there was a woman sitting in the corner of this hut, r shaking a rattle, wearing a, a leopard skin sort of outfit, an old woman. Um, and, and, and shaking cowrie shells, almost like casting the runes. And on the ground in front of her were three very worried-looking mothers with very emaciated, ill-looking, sick children lying on a straw mat on the floor. And she was talking to the spirits and prescribing the cure. And she, as the translator told me, she was telling them, you need to winnow rice over the child, and that will drive out the sickness. And 
we find that difficult to, to relate to, you know, but that was the belief that these women held. Uh, and it will be very, it's not a, having seen that, the, the power of those beliefs, it's not a very big step to say that, you know, a, a leader in a community can manipulate those sorts of beliefs to instill a sense of fear or a sense of loyalty uh, or a sense of indeed meaning amongst his followers. Also, there's a history to this, isn't there, in that you know, Joseph Conley built upon the experiences <coughs> of many of his own followers in, who had followed Alice Laquena before him. I mean, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that background for people who don't know about it. It would be useful, I think. Yeah, I think, I think that, and this is in a way the kind of hidden history behind this phrase that kept getting recycled about ruling according to the Ten Commandments, which essentially is shorthand for a much bigger history. I mean, I think the key thing about the LRA that, that was often lost in the coverage, um, because it, simply because the war had gone on for so long, was that the origins were quite simple in a way. There was a, a civil war in the south of Uganda. The army that was fighting the war was made up, uh, or included many Acholi soldiers. Um, when President Museveni, who was then a guerrilla leader, defeated that army, the soldiers, this was in 1986, the soldiers fled back home to the north of Uganda because they were really genuinely afraid that Museveni was going to come and take revenge on them. And they had done terrible things. The soldiers had committed atrocities during the fighting. They'd looted, they'd raped. You know, they, they came back home with blood on their hands. And this precipitated a sort of terrible social crisis. On the one hand, you had the fear that the new government was coming up the road to, to exact revenge. But at the same time, there was a sort of collective sense of guilt. Hang on. you know. Actually, our young guys have done some pretty bad things. You know, we can't deny that, you know, th there's a problem here. In that, there was a sort of mixture of, uh, of sort of guilt and fear that gave rise to a, a totally unprecedented crisis in the North. And it was in that environment that spiritual leaders, drawing on both the Christian faith that had come during colonialism and the older, deeper beliefs uh, of a chully spirituality, emerged to sort of offer redemption. So Alice Lequena was by far the most famous. She was a sort of almost an early prototype for Joseph Kony. Um, she was a fishmonger. Um, she became possessed and she promised to uh, lead or sort of fight a war to end all wars in Uganda. And tens of thousands of, or, of Acholi, or thousands of Acholi certainly flocked to her ranks. And uh, partly because they believed she would solve both the guilt that they were experiencing and protect them in a physical sense. And she led this army um, south uh, towards Kampala for months. And she daubed them with crosses of shea butter oil on their foreheads and chests, saying, you know, you will be immune to bullets if you follow our 20, the very famous 20 Holy Spirit safety precautions, uh, which, you know, again, famously are cited as having, you know, you, men will have two testicles, no more and no less, is one of the kind of most famous rules of the 20 Holy Spirit safety precautions, right? you know, and um, no eating before battle, no, no sh respecting water, no hiding behind anthills. It was almost a sort of First World War battle technique where people would sort of march into battle. Um, and obviously the, 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 the Ugandan army disproved the theory at the end of a few months and she was defeated. But it showed the power, the redemptive power of these sort of deeper beliefs and how they could be used to mobilize people. So I think Kony was very much inherited that tradition, but in a, in a less spectacular way, but for a much longer period. I think with, with, it's worth bearing in mind that with Alice Auma, who became the La Quena, mm. that she was an Ajwaka, very much like the woman who you met um, throwing her, uh, her, her, her um, sticks and, uh, and, yeah. and, and shells and interpreting the world. She was a very powerful Ajwaka before she took on this role. Mm. And I think what was most important about her movement in terms of the spiritual model for George of Cogni was that she taught that violence was therapeutic. She's not the first person to suggest that. But she taught that the killing um, was a form of healing. And you know, within the Acholi language, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I think it's hard to understand the impact of George of Cogni without seeing it within that context. And I, I feel like it gets a little bit lost in the book. I mean, mm. there's many really great things about it, but that aspect of it and the 
the very powerful link between those local spirit cults and biomedicine, you know, public health programs, and Pentecostal Christianity, and the kind of resistance to patriarchal authority, often marginal people, you know, women mm. who are barren like Alice, or uh, son of a migrant like Joseph Corny, um, take on this particular kind of role. And it seems to me that that's been crucial at that, mm. particularly in that early stage in the emergence of uh, the LRA. Certainly it was crucial for the Holy Spirit movement. Are you convinced? Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I think for me that it, it was such a hard, the spiritual side was mm. almost the hardest aspect of the conflict to grapple with because mm. it is so far removed from, from one's experience living in the West or mm. you know, growing up in the sort of Western culture. It's very difficult. I mean, I, 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 I'd acknowledge definitely mm. that it's something that, that is important, but it, it, very hard to, I'm st you know, much as I sort of know some of the facts behind mm. it or some of the explanations, I still find it very hard to really feel like I have a, a real grasp of it. I, th I think a, a really big difference between Connie's LRA and Alice Laquena's Holy Spirit movement was that she had this notion of a mass movement. Mm. With Connie, right from the start, he didn't seek a mass following. The LRA has always operated with fairly small groups. Mm. And in a way, they've been a classic terrorist organization. Yeah, they've gone exactly. in and they haven't killed vast numbers of people, but they've selected 20 women with their babies and have mm. taken them to the edge of the compound yeah. and smashed their brains in and cut some lips off people and yeah. then gone away. And the effect of that has been terrifying. It's very different to the sort of strategies that Alice Laquena was using beforehand. Mm. Do, you, do you have any sense of why they went down that route? I mean, you talk about punishing the Acholi people, but. Is that an adequate explanation? I mean, the kind of political agenda that they're now articulating about the North and the South seems very different from that. No, I think, I think that's true. I think, in a way, that it, you're right. In a sense, it, it was a terrorist organization, and it's a very cheap, br simple form of terrorism to use in that environment. You know, they're not obviously sort of detonating car bombs or sort of mm. um, launching terrorist-style attacks. but. Like you say, the impact on a population of chopping off one person's lips or hands is going to spread through thousands of people. And I think, I think what I was trying to say earlier was that the, the logic, if you like, how, however horrible that is is, is, is about denying the government the support of the people. As long as the LRA, as a tiny, relatively tiny organization, can prove that nowhere in northern Uganda is safe, They've succeeded in one objective, which is to convince people that the government is not the answer. So you're left with a sort of stalemate um, situation where the people are in the middle. The government is trying to fight almost a conventional war, but not really paying any serious attention to winning hearts and minds, to use that sort of rather tired phrase. But at the same time, the LRA certainly wasn't winning any hearts. Um, or minds, but it was certainly scaring the hell out of people. Mm. Um, so essentially, neither side could say that they had the, the LRA. The, the government hadn't won popular support, but by using those tactics, the LRA was denying um, them that support as well. Mm. So I think it's true. There, there's a spiritual dimension to it, but I think there's also a quite a cold military logic to it as well. Yeah. I mean, the spiritual um, aspect of it remained very frightening, didn't it? I mean, mm. when you talk to those people in the displacement camps about the LRA, they, they call them Olum. They call yeah. them the bush. Yeah. They are the bush, yeah. where the rules don't apply. And they say when, when there's LRA attacks, they say the, the Olum has come, yeah. the bush has yeah. come. And it plays to I mean, local nightmares, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. both sides have used nightmares. The, Ugandan governments also use nightmares to terrify people the way that they don't allow um, people to bury dead bodies. Mm. They, they manipulated these things just as much as the LRA have, haven't they, really? Mm. Mm. I mean, one of the things that comes out in your book, I think, increasingly as you go through it, is that from this you know, perception of the LRA as this weird organization, you ended up having a very critical view of what the Ugandan government's been doing in northern Uganda. Yes. And I think by the end of the book, you present a rather scathing account of the aid agencies that 
for all sorts of reasons, became involved in the perpetration of structural violence on the population of northern Uganda on a quite daunting scale. And I think, I think you bring that out quite well. But do you want to say a bit about that? Yeah, I think it's very interesting, again, to come at it from the journalist's point of view. I mean, I can be very honest that when I look back on myself coming to Nairobi for the first time in 2001 as a reporter, I know that I had this sort of subliminal idea that aid agencies were good and that they came to Africa to save people. And I think that was quite a deeply embedded assumption that, that tended to unconsciously inform reporting. Um, and I remember, I mean, there's a, a line, a paragraph in the book where I sort of talk about this. I can remember sitting in the office of the Nairobi Bureau late on a Friday and a, a fax coming through from the World Food Program, which is part of the UN that um, distributes emergency food in northern Uganda, saying, oh, we need to raise 30 million more dollars to buy more food for northern Uganda. And I'd actually give myself a little pat on the back. I said, okay, Matt, you know, you can, you can do it for northern Uganda. You, know, you can spend five minutes writing uh, a few paragraphs and putting it out on the wire saying, WFP appeals for food for these poor starving people in northern Uganda. Thinking I was doing a great job, but actually blissfully unaware that with the best will in the world, you know, being as charitable as you like towards WFP, they had become sucked into the system that was causing a great deal of suffering. Uh, the way it worked was the government in the sort of, in about 1996, the government realized that it wasn't containing the LRA problem. So they set up this strategy of creating what they call protected camps. Um, I'd often assume that people had sort of run spontaneously in fear of the LRA into these camps and sort of just built them overnight themselves. But actually, the army basically ordered them in, gave people ultimatums over the radio saying, right, you've got to leave your homes and go and live in these camps. And they said at the time it would be for a few months while we you know, sorted out the problem. And um, the army spokesman would always use this wonderful phrase that the latest massacre was the last kicks of a dying horse, you know. And he'd say that every time the LRA committed a new atrocity, and he was saying that sort of 10 years later. All the, 10 years later, the camps were still there, and they caused arguably much more suffering than the rebels. The amount of disease, the sort of squalor, the social deprivation that people suffered were, were appalling. And all this time, WFP was effectively sponsoring this strategy by driving truck a truckload of food every month and making sure that people didn't starve because while they were in the camp they, they couldn't go out and farm so but no, but uh, while there was this humanitarian imperative we need to save lives there's people about to starve to death no one seemed to be asking well hang on a minute you know is it really correct for the government to be herding hundreds of thousands of people into camps um, and leaving them there apparently indefinitely mm -hmm. um, but, but because the imperative was, oh, we've got to go and save people from starving, we, we won't look at the, the bigger picture, um, no, one asked, no one seems to ask that question. I mean, um, you know, there was a quote I remember from one humanitarian saying, you know, if Auschwitz had occurred in, 2000, in the year 2000, it would have been called a humanitarian disaster. Um, and that, that's an extreme way of saying that, you know, aid agencies sometimes look away from the cause of the suffering um, they try to treat the Im they try to treat the suffering, but sometimes by doing that, they they actually become part of the system that's causing that suffering. Mm -hmm. So that that was something for me as a, that was actually quite a revelation because I had never really considered these questions in the day to day sort of flow of journalism. Um, I think it was also to do with the fact that Uganda was seen as such a success story for aid, um, for, you know, for receiving aid for such a long time and so successful apparently in dealing with HIV AIDS that there was an unwillingness for donors to be critical of yeah. what was happening. I think that was also part of it. Yeah, I think you know, we, you know, as Western governments were so desperate for credible allies in Africa, mm -hmm. you know, this was the, this was the mid-90s, say, there was a genocide in Rwanda. Um, Congo was still under Mobutu. Mm -hmm. um, civil war raging in southern Sudan. Kenya under Daniel Arap Moy going rapidly backwards. You know, Uganda seemed like, you know, banner from heaven. It was actually an ally that we can, we can count on. And the last thing anyone wanted to do was to look too closely at, at the failings of the Museveni's policy in the north. And, and in a way, that, that was why this sort of myth of Kony, if you like, this focus on the Ten Commandments and the, the irrationality of the group, mm. it served a lot of people's objectives, because it, it served the government's objective, because it meant that anybody who, it, it meant that talking about why it sort of made it impossible to have a discussion about why that war persisted because it was just blamed on one apparently deranged 
sort of self-styled mystic. But it, but it also meant that Western governments didn't really have to look at it either, because it was always written off as, as, as just a sort of crazy, uh, incomprehensible manifestation of some sort of terrible darkness in northern Uganda that wasn't actually the symptom of a deeper, deeper issue. Uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but Alara Otunu, the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations, who um, uh, had, uh, he used to have a position of um, uh, um, representing the High Commissioner, with the Secretary General, with respect to children in situations of armed conflict, he's been talking about there being a genocide in northern Uganda. Do you think that's overstating it? Well, that, that's a very good question, and, and it's one that I confess I almost I consciously ducked when I was writing mm. about it. Um, and I think that, that was partly because I suppose I, I, my, 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 I suppose the, the argument is, of course, that you know, by creating these camps, the government in, Nor the government in Kampala was committing genocide because the conditions were so bad, so many people were dying of disease, um, that, that, that actually the sort of death rate was almost like being in a concentration camp. I mean, that was the argument he was advancing. Um, uh, and Alara Rutuni, we should perhaps mention, was, uh, he is an Acholi and was an opponent of Museveni, um, who then joined the UN system and became a, quite a, an undersecretary general in, in favor of children's rights. So in, you, it, it, he is a, a bitter enemy of, of Museveni. So it was very difficult to sort of separate out his political agenda from what he was saying about genocide. It was, it, genocide seemed like a very, easy stick with which to beat the government. And I have to confess, I, I, I don't think the government was deliberately committing genocide. I don't think that was the intention. I think I, I, the way I, and I, I grappled with this question for months, I thought, hang on, you know, have I stumbled upon hidden genocide that we should all be writing is a genocide? I mean, that was something that, that I, we talked about a lot in Northern Uganda and thought about a lot. But my conclusion was almost, well, hang on. It, They've put people in camps. This is their strategy. It's a disaster. It's terrible, willful neglect. Um, there may even be a, some sort of political motive. Why? Why not? More is being done. But it's almost like manslaughter as opposed to murder. I don't think, to be honest, that Museveni set out to to wipe out the Acholi people. Mm -hmm. But I do think I don't think that lets him off the hook. I still think that the the, the, the degree of negligence, the degree of of almost willful neglect, was such that. It, it would count in court. You could make a manslaughter charge stick much more easily. Maybe we should move on now to kind of this part of your kind of learning process that you went through in in this journey. But maybe you should tell us now how the journey progressed. How that you finally met with Joseph Corney. Tell us how with that a happened. Large degree of luck in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we went. Um, in a sense, it was very lucky, the timing of the whole trip, because as, as I said at the beginning, it started off looking like it was going to be mission impossible, simply because this man was now the want most wanted man in Africa. Why would he suddenly mm. pop up and start meeting strangers? Um, but this peace process, unbeknown to me, was already beginning to gain momentum. Um, so when I was in Juba, I, I went to the uh, a, a sort of commemoration day for the a separate war in southern Sudan, which was led by the SPLA rebel movement. For years, they were fighting the government in Khartoum. Um, they took power and they, they were celebrating the, the start of their uprising 20 years before. And they made this announcement, you know, we've captured Joseph Kony on tape. You know, we've met him, we've filmed him in a clearing. Um, and he says he wants to talk peace. So suddenly, you know, it was all, I literally almost, I was sort of falling asleep until this point. I sort of almost fell out of my chair. Well, hang on, you know. This guy is now appearing. Um, so that, that was the moment, I think, where I realized well, it would be possible to see him. Um, and there were lots of twists and turns and setbacks and um, bad judgment by myself that meant that meeting him took a lot longer than <laughs> possibly should have done. Um, but in the end, he did present himself uh, in a remote clearing as one of a series of meetings um, with, with these mediators uh, at the, who were trying to get this process going. And what happened? I mean, you shook his hand. <laughs> Tell us about shaking his hand. <laughs> I know, it's rather embarrassing, actually, because um, I, I, I've been... Uh, we, the, 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 
we went to these. We went on a series of trips. The first time you went, we went. Uh, we waited for days on the border in a, a very remote outpost called Nabanga, where um, not the most comfortable of places, um, deep in a sort of jungle, essentially on the border between Congo and Sudan. We waited for days and days, and eventually we were summoned to the clearing. It was an empty chair in front of us. Eventually. A few rebels turned up, but they told us that Joseph Cody himself was too tired that day to, uh, to attend to us, so we'd have to come back another time. So a few more weeks passed, and we made the final trip. Um, it was almost like a flying circus. Um, the government of southern Sudan organized to take his r former wives of Joseph Kony, his relatives of the commanders, elders from northern Uganda, from southern Sudan, and literally about 200 people were rotated in on these rickety old Antonov cargo planes, including a small group of journalists. So we waited again for days and days in the clearing, um, wondering whether he would turn up. Um, and I was becoming increasingly <coughs> pessimistic about the chances of him coming. The first, the first time he, we thought he was coming, he, he, he sent one of his followers, a guy called Captain Sunday, who's rather an erratic character, who came down the trail leading a little boy with him. We're like, well, you know, who, who is this? And I, Coney had sent one of his many sons out as a sort of offering to say, look, I am going to come, but you know, here's my son, you know, just wait a few more days as I sort of get myself ready. And then finally, he, he uh, I think it must have been about the fourth or fifth day, there was a sort of, again, a sort of rustling in the undergrowth, and this column of, must have been at least a hundred of these rebels sort of marched out in single file. And we could see this figure in a white suit, a sort of white short sleeve shirts and trousers, sort of immaculately ironed, you know, stepping out of the, the jungle. And um, he sort of brushed past us, looking very agitated and very, um, very, very sort of tense. And yeah, I, I, you know, I realized I couldn't come all this way and not at least exchange a few words with him. So I went into the tent where he was meeting the elders, and I sort of thrust out my hand and said, yes, I'm Matthew Green, I'm writing a book about you, you know, I, maybe we could have a chat, you know, a bit later when you're finished. And, he sort of visibly seemed to recoil. I mean, he, you know, he looked at me like literally till jumped almost, and um, looked baffled as to what to do. And I sort of felt my hand hanging in midair, and I thought I was going to sort of suffer the greatest snub in history. And he, he then he looked to an advisor who sort of nodded because he knew me and darted out his hand. And we had this very brief handshake and, and sort of exchanged glances for a few seconds before he whipped his hand away, and I was kind of hustled out. Um, so fortunately, he was persuaded by his advisors to then give a, his first ever press conference um, in 20 years, where he, he then did submit himself to a few questions. But uh, as you'll see from the book, they weren't the most revealing of, uh, of answers. What do you think you learned most from writing the book? It, I, think, I think it was the, the value of having the time to get to know people in a, in, an, in, a, in a sort of story as we, you know, as a journalist, you know, you never have that luxury of, of having time, you, especially in the way that the industry works now, working for someone like Reuters, you know, I think, you know, Reuters does a fantastic job of covering East Africa, it, there's stories about every country all the time, uh, you know, without that service, you wouldn't have a clue what was going on in half these places, but there is an obvious limitation, you turn up, often you can't help but recycle received wisdom. Uh, and it's, it's often, like you say, that kind of group thing. You talk to the same people who talk to the same people, and you end up reinforcing a dominant uh, version of the story, uh, unwittingly maybe, serving the interests of governments or donors, or, or you just don't know. Mm. But the, the real revelation for me was having had time to, to actually forge relationships with people in northern Uganda, where they told me things that they would never have told me if they'd known me for mm. a few hours. And that really changed my mind about the conflict and made me realize that it was actually, in the minds of the protagonists, a lot more rational and a lot more actually, a lot easier to understand actually than, I, than I'd actually thought. Um, so it was, it was that luxury of time, I think, that, that was really the key thing. Let me throw it out now to the audience. Has anybody got any question over here? Yeah. Uh, there's, been a lot, there's been a lot of talk about how the arrest warrant from the international court is uh, is not a good idea. And I wonder if you could comment on that. Yeah, I, I mean that that was very much a current debate um, while I was there in northern Uganda. You know, there was a, a strong body of opinion that it was a big mistake of the International Criminal Court uh, in The Hague to issue these warrants because it would make 
Joseph Kony much less likely to negotiate. You know, it would push him further away. Um, it would, it, and, and there was a, a body of criticism uh, that said, you know, there's this court that's just been set up in Europe. It's imposing its kind of justice on northern Uganda, uh, and it's actually very insensitive. It, 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 it's, it's pushing away any chance of, of starting negotiations. Um, and I, I, had, I, had, I started off having some sympathy with that view at the time, um, and particularly because of a few mistakes the court made. People didn't think it was neutral. People thought the court was siding with Museveni. Um, so there was a lot of resentment on the ground. Um, but I think that it was more nuanced than that. There's also some suggestion that the fact that these warrants were issued gave the focus the rebel leaders' minds. I thought, hang on, you know. We're, we're getting noticed now, you know, Britain, America, you know, European powers, in UN is sort of, is that we're now under the spotlight. We should maybe think about how we're going to get out of this corner. Um, and I, I don't know whether that's an argument that's made, and I think that probably does hold some water, that it did actually concentrate the rebel leaders' minds into, how, into whether talks <laughs> might be a, a good idea. But then the problem, though, is, of course, this first demand at the talks is lift the arrest warrants. So you get that kind of catch-22 situation. Um, but I think the most recent development, we were discussing this just before we came in, was that Joseph Kenny has killed one of his deputies who was also indicted, a man named, or not indicted, but who'd also, who was also wanted, a man named Vincent Otti. And it may be, uh, you know, Tim probably knows this better than me, but it may be that the court is, is just sitting back and saying, OK, well, we've got these guys boxed up in a corner. Eventually, they've either got to come out or they're going to tear themselves to pieces. So, so it, it may be, it, uh, uh, going from a quite a skeptical position about the ICC, I feel now that maybe that in the long run, their, their strategy might be borne out. Please, yeah. <laughs> Matthew, like um, you, I think I was near 2002, right about where Charles Sully was in Uganda, and like you, I was appalled at the IDP camps. I thought they were some of the worst I'd ever seen relatively experienced, but I became completely fascinated by the situation. And I'd like to ask a bit more about what your impressions were. My first question, and my second is, as I understand it, a lot of people who were there at the time, the photographer that I was working with, that nothing terribly much has changed up there. And yet the reporting from there seems to be fairly slim. And I wanted to know really, why do you think this is? Is it because of the way that the media works? Is it because of the same old story? Is it because we're just repeating ourselves what? I think on, on, on Joseph Kony himself, it's, it's very interesting because there's almost two Konies. There's a sort of, there's the Kony you hear about through his former followers or from former abductees. And there's the Kony that I saw, and I, let's face it, I saw him a couple of occasions pretty briefly in rather exceptional circumstances. And the impression I got when I saw him was this guy's a very frightened man. You know, he knows that he's, he's running out of chances. Um, and and he, he didn't look uh, he didn't look ha happy at all. Um, but w what's interesting is that I think the, the, the most the biggest insight I got into him in terms of uh, how he operates was from a former LRA commander named Moses, who was abducted at 16, who I got to know quite well over the months that I was in the north. Um, and he would he would our relationship, as we got to know each other better, he would tell me more and more about how the LRA operated. I mean, he was in it for eight years and uh, was quite a, because he was relatively educated when he was abducted, he was quite a senior commander. Um, and, and really, you know, Kenny commanded a great deal of respect. Um, and that he was a very skilled orator. Um, he would use a trolley proverbs to illustrate his points. He would talk for hours giving a sort of combination of almost political propaganda and religious sermon all rolled into one. And the audience would be pretty wrapped, and they, they would start to take on board the message. And I think that, that element of skill shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, the guy, you know, to run an organization like the LRA and keep going for 20 years, you've got to, you've got to have something. Um, but the interesting thing was the contrast with the person being so, so sort of frightened and so small, in a way. Um, <laughs> On the question of what's happening now, um, it's true the story's fallen off. You know, we're not reading much about northern Uganda. I think what's interesting is that 
although the government is very keen to present a picture of life returning to normal, that thousands of people are leaving these camps and going home, in the Acholi area, which is the real epicenter of the conflict, very few people have gone home. I think you, Tim was probably there more recently. But actually, people are sort of feeling their way back, uh, going back to some of their old farms, sort of trying to see what land they, they own, what they can salvage, or what they might be able to lay claim to. But still, I think 98% of the Acholi who are displaced are still in the camps. And until Kony himself, you know, until they've seen a resolution to this, I think it's going to be quite hard for them to go back to normal. I, you may be there more recently, but um, yeah, I uh, apologise. Uh, call of nature. I mean, it's <laughs> interesting that you know, having been with the LRA, who have a ban on yeah. consumption of alcohol, uh, I had a hard to do before we started. Um, yes, I was out there. Uh, well, you were out there last. I think yeah, well, maybe about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. But I had the opportunity to kind of go out with some of the people who were returning to their homes and. There was a big difference between the Langley areas to the south and to yeah. the south and the Acholi areas. But also the Ugandan army was not offering to protect people mm. in beyond a certain um, line. And uh, and so for many of the Acholi people it meant going back to places where there would be no security. Yeah. yeah. What was very striking though was that many of those groups that I went with back to their original farms in the Acholi area and they were kind of going informally is that they were requesting that there would be a Ugandan army um, with them. They were looking for soldiers who were willing to go with them back to their homes. And I found that quite interesting, that mm. you know, people have been living with the army for so long that they now feel quite uncomfortable going back into rural areas with no military personnel around. That was very striking, yeah. I think. Yeah. Mm. Another question? Yes. Thank you very much. Well, I'll start by saying my granddad. I came to this country in July to pursue my master's degree in information management. And I'm really so happy to be here today. Um, I must say the situation in Uganda is threatening. I mean, I think internationally, like uh, Maki was saying, it's it's something that has been taken lightly, but for Uganda to be in the spotlight in only one region, northern Uganda, is really, really daunting. <laughs> um, what should I say? Everything he has told you is really, really true, and it's happening. People's noses were cut off. People's lips were cut off. I don't know which other body parts. <laughs> what part of Uganda are you from? Western Uganda. Yeah. The southwest. Uh, west. That's okay. um, the area where the government, uh, the leader, of the government comes from. So. And have you been up to the north? Have you seen the north? No, I haven't seen the, the north. Unfortunately. It's a pity I've been in my country for so long and I haven't even gone to the northern part. It's actually really scary to go to the northern part. It, <laughs> it's very scary. My auntie here can tell you. <laughs> it's really scary. But what I want to ask is, yeah. what is the way forward? The war has been going on for more than 18 years now. Okay. Yeah. What is the way forward? It's, it's not just about Uganda being in the spotlight, but what is what's going to happen next you've written a book what yeah i mean let let me respond to that what's the way forward Matt? thank you well I, I think there's there's a question there's obviously the immediate question about what happens to the lra and the leaders of the lra and, and how that peace process is resolved that's a very difficult um that's obviously a, a difficult question to know how that's going to play out. Um, Kony is obviously worried about being arrested. There's all those issues, but he's. Let, let's assume even that the LRA is taken care of. That they look like they're they're boxed into a corner in Congo. You know, let, let's just say that over the next couple of years, maybe Kony will be killed by one of his officers. Let's just let's just take the LRA out of the picture. It's very interesting that you say you're from the west of Uganda and you've never been to the north, and that it would be terribly scary to go there. I mean. You might be surprised that it's not actually as scary as, as it sounds. I mean, this is, this is something that struck me 
in Uganda, uh, and, and is that there is this amazing, this amazing division between the area north of the River Nile and the rest of the country. And people in the south sort of, when they, uh, they sort of see the north as this sort of backward, primitive, sort of barbarous area, um, which is almost a not part of Uganda. It's almost, as, I, I, I don't know whether, whether that's, um, I mean, that, that's an, that is an opinion you encounter in, in, the, in Kampala. And then equally in the north, people feel excluded. They feel like we're not considered to be real Ugandans. We're not treated equally. Um, there's a linguistic divide over the Nile. There's cultural divides. There's historical divides. Um, but I think the, the, the real question about the way forward is, how does Uganda overcome that division? You know, how do people from the rest of the country feel like the north is part of the country? And how do the northerners feel like they're part of Uganda? And that's a bigger question than simply what happens to Joseph Kony and his commanders. And then, you know, it'd be very tempting to conclude that, you know, without some sort of action or some sort of national reconciliation, if you like, that this problem could recur in a different form, as it's done in so many African countries. Yeah, an incident that really brought that home to me was one time we were driving down from Gulu South across the, the river, um, the Nile, and we went into Masindi, which is one of the, you know, one of the first big towns that you come to in, in, in southern Uganda, coming, coming down from the north. And the woman who was a young lady, very much like you actually, looked a bit like you, was putting the fuel in the car and she said, oh, you've come from the north. It's terrible there, isn't it? And she described the situation. <laughs> and uh, you know, she kind of said it was just awful, those children that she saw. They were just terrible. They were, they were suffering, they were starving, and it was awful. And I said, oh, you've been there? And she goes, no, no, I watched it on Opera Winfrey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, she sort of kind of captured yeah. something about the yeah. weekend. Yeah. But yes. Oh, there's one of my students. Say hello there. <laughs> hello, mine is not a question, just a comment. Um, today I had some students from LSD who went to see some lady. She's in Uganda, um, but she's around at the moment. She's the one in charge of um, resettling people who have been in camps back to their homes. And she told us that, that uh, since Kony was referred to International Criminal Court, uh, somehow, because, I mean, the tactics the Ugandan government was using also to fight the rebels are not good. Likewise, Kony was also coming to abduct Northern Uganda so much. So since then, um, the situation has been a bit OK. And uh, she encouraged them actually to go to Uganda and research about it. So All right. yeah, most of them are coming to the Uganda. Yeah. So maybe they will be able to update us about okay. the Uganda situation. But I think referring things to international criminal court has somehow helped both sides. Yeah, well, certainly that's been my, my view in the end. Richard, yeah. Um, my name is Richard Dowd, and I've uh, director of the Royal African Society, but a journalist by tribe. Um, <coughs> um, the only other movements in Africa that have faintly resembled um, the LRA are uh, the RUF in Sierra Leone and Renamo in Mozambique. They, they use the very, sim very, very similar tactics and seem to have no other political agenda other than fighting back. Uh, they have no plan once they took over the, over the country. Um, the other one that, it be, that comes to mind, and this is very controversial, is Mau Mau, which Elspeth Huxley described as a scream from the swamp. I think this is the expression <laughs> she used. I mean, it is a, no more than a, than a scream. But it seems to me that it does actually touch something quite um, profound here, particularly when someone like Alara Tulu, one of the most intelligent and sophisticated operators the United Nations has had for a long time, the fact that he gives it some credibility, argues that it's justified, not necessarily justified, he would never go that far, but uh, it, he regards it as a civil war, I think says, says quite a lot. So there seems to be three possibilities. Either it is a scream from the swamp, and even someone like Alara Tunu, because of the, he is from that group, joins in. Or it's justified by equivalent bad behavior from the other side, and 
the fact is that in 1985, 86, uh, and the early 80s, um, Museveni's troops behaved exceedingly well. They were very well disciplined. They were, they were mostly children, child soldiers, but they were very, very well organized and had very, they were very idealistic. Meanwhile, the Uganda, the British trained Uganda army, which was largely a choli led butchered, maimed, slaughtered throughout the whole of the Luweru Triangle. Um, and as they were defeated and retreated, um, they again raped, murdered, and Museveni's army moved in. It was clean, it was decent, it behaved well, uh, and it was like, it was just like two different worlds. Um, unless something changed when they crossed the Nile, and they then took on the same role as the northerners had behaved when they were in the south. I, I find it difficult to find anything. I mean, bad tactics maybe, trying to get everybody into camps. They were only imitating what the British did in, in Malaya, in Kenya, and in various other places, which is uh, encampment and then chase the, the people out in the bush. Um, or there may be a third explanation, which is that it was cynically manipulated by senior members of the Ugandan army and other people manipulating the LRA for totally different ends. In the case of senior people in the LRA, and I'm thinking of um, the head of intelligence there, Charles. Charles Otema. Charles, yeah, exactly. Not in, in, not in the LRA, in the in the UPDF. On the government side, yeah. he had a, a, every day a four o'clock yeah. phone call with Museveni and told him what was going on, and had frequently been presented with possibilities for defeating the LRA, but never quite got there in time or passed the information. I mean, people like that who made a huge amount of money out mm. of the war, that actually the, both sides were being manipulated by uh, other self-interested players. I, I give you those three scenarios. <laughs> where would you, where well, I think we've ruled out Scream from the Swamp, because you know, any, any, any sort of explanation that just resorts to say, well, these are a bunch of crazy people doing horrible things because that's what they do. There's something, got to be something beneath that. It's also clearly not a conventional rebel movement in the sense of building popular support, uh, having a clearly set out plan for when they take over. Um, and it, it can't, you know, because of the nature of the atrocities it commits, it can't have any credible claim to speak on behalf of an oppressed people. They are the oppressors. So yeah, it's got to, it's got to be a third thing. And I, I think what, I think it, the, the, the circumstances that gave rise to it um, are important. 20 years ago, the UPDF, although they were well behaved, as you say, in some areas, in the north of Uganda in 86, 87, they weren't very well behaved. They were coming up and getting their money, you know, their, their, their revenge. I mean, and that, that did happen in, in areas that created this huge fear. So it started off as a, resi as a resistance movement. But it very rapidly degenerated, um, partly because of the personal sense of betrayal that the leaders felt, and partly because they saw, I, I think, they were very quickly into a fight for survival. And they were looking for, they, they, were, they were fighting in the most brutal, cynical, but effective way they could. That's not to excuse it, but it's just try to trace the rationality behind it. Um, and I think you touched on one other aspect. Of course, the UPDF, the Ugandan army, has been inept uh, virtually throughout this entire, uh, entire conflict, partly because there were officers making a lot of money out of a war situation. Um, at one point, there was a report that came out about ghost soldiers, who are soldiers who are supposed to be on the payroll, but actually the money is going straight into their commander's pockets. This report, which was an internal report commissioned by the army, said that, in fact, two-thirds of the army were ghosts. So you, know, <laughs> you can see why there'd be an incentive to carry on fighting. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, of course, is the role of Sudan. For many years, the government in Khartoum in Sudan sponsored the LRA. And you could almost view the LRA as a branch of the Sudanese armed forces. They were fighting the Ugandan army because they, the Museveni was in turn sponsoring the rebels fighting the Sudanese government. It's a sort of proxy war fought that way. So there's many, many dimensions um, that defy a simple categorization, I think. I think the LRA have taken on different agendas in different contexts, haven't mm. it? And, and at yeah. different times. Exactly. Yeah. At the point where they were getting a lot of funding from the Sudan government, 
um, they clearly began to see themselves as one of a number of militia. Um, another one, of course, being led by Riyak Mashar, who's now you know, the vice president of Southern Sudan. Well, exactly. And it's a region where you can go from being a br brutal rebel leader to a minister pretty quickly. You know. Yeah. 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 Hello, Matthew. Um, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite interested in how you came about uh, covering West and East Africa. I mean, was it your decision or was it Reuters? Did they send you out? And the access that you got, was that up to you or did Reuters sort that out for you? And also, what's your plans on the future? Like, are you going back out there to carry on, etc.? Well, I Okay, I mean, I first came to Africa as a, doing a gap year teaching in Tanzania before I went to university. And that was really my first encounter with Africa. And I think from that point, I, I sort of wanted to come back and I lobbied Reuters to send me out to Nairobi. Um, so I was lucky enough to get sent there. Um, and, and yeah, from when you said access, what, what did you mean? Uh, from, from managing to get the... Managing to get the But in the book, it was it was sort of independent for Reuters. I just turned up in Gulu and talked to people. Oh, right. I literally, I mean, it's you know, you get phone numbers and you be. It's actually a, a very it's a small town. You know, you can almost feel like you know everyone within about a week because it's so small. You know, you, there's a hotel called the Acholi Inn where you know owned one by Colonel Latema, owned, owned, by the, the, owned by the head of military <laughs> intelligence <laughs> who makes a lot of money from. He, he's supposed to be fighting the war, but he's actually making rather a lot of money from the buffet that he serves every night, which is in turn patronized by aid workers, journalists, diplomats, conflict resolution mediators, you know. You know so it, it, everybody's kind of living in this sort of bubble. You, you know, you look across the lawn at night. On the one side, you've got investigators from the criminal court trying to look very surreptitious and hoping nobody notices them, but you know, everyone knows who they are. You've got a table of aid workers on the other side. You've got actually former LRA commanders who've Come surrendered yes. and accepted amnesty sitting at another table, you know, kicking back, chatting. Army officers at the next table, you know, you almost don't have to leave the hotel and you can... Often the very much do. I mean, it really is like <laughs> quite extraordinary. I remember one evening we had, had Colonel of Tema, Betty Bigombe, two former um, brigadiers in the LRA yeah. all sitting around the table and various government uh, officials from, uh, from, the, from the area and the telephone rang and it was um, Vincent Otti ringing from the bush <laughs> um, asking for more air time. <laughs> yeah, he said he needs to load him up. Yeah, so he can load him up. Yeah, British were paying his phone bill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not his mobile phone bill, they were paying the satellite phone bill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my, my little boy who was with me up there, I, mean, I had my family with me and my, my boy at that point was 10. And uh, he said, I want to make an interview with all these people. <laughs> so I said, all right, we'll ask Colonel Otema. And uh, Colonel Otema said, oh, yes, I will be interviewed. And he put his uniform on. <laughs> <laughs> and my little boy was sort of mentioned, said, well, how did you feel when you were made a colonel? <laughs> oh, I <was> <laughs> and then he goes, and, he, and then he goes, um, and, and uh, how do you feel when you're fighting the LRA? Oh, I'm very proud of <laughs> And then he goes, and how do you manage to run a hotel as well? <laughs> <laughs> that was a question none of us dared to no, ask. No, no, no. I asked it was just, you know, you, you <laughs> run such a good hotel with such a nice buffet. With <laughs> <laughs> that was the best question. Yeah. <laughs> with following on who might profit from the conflict, I was just wondering your opinion really on the rumours you might be hearing the local communities about possible acquiring of land and building of roads by the dodgy subcontractors and yeah, is, is this something you think might be true? Uh, yeah, I mean I think what, you know, in the north you do encounter these stories um, of, of people making money from the war, not just the sort of head of military intelligence running a hotel, but across the board you've got on the one hand stories of people who were suspected of collaborating with the LRA within the camps being, you know, they, they would sort of run errands for the LRA, disappear off into the bush, take some Wellington boots to them or some airtime for their phones, come back, make money that way. And people would say, this house has been built with LRA money. But on the other side, you've got the government making money. And, and you're quite right, you know, who is providing the transport, for example, for the trucks that bring tons and tons of, you know, you've got enough food to feed two million people a month coming in on trucks 
who owns those trucks? And I, you know, I think there's, uh, this was something I never got into in detail, but certainly there's a suggestion that it's senior members of the government who are the contractors who are providing the food that the UN is paying for. Um, and the same, there's talk about the army taking over forestry reserves and chopping down the trees. A lot of that uh, from southern Sudan, just felling teak uh, while they were fighting over there. You know, so there's, yeah, there's certainly a whole war economy taking place, which again, is, on a short visit, is invisible. But certainly that, that's one of the reasons why senior people in government were very happy to let this thing rumble on. There's a, uh, a road between Gulu going westward to Pakwat and then up to the Congo border, and it was always said to be very insecure out there. It's not far from where Colonel Otema has his own farm. Actually. Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I managed to get into and onto that road during the day, um, coming in from the south, and it was amazing. You know, from about 11 o'clock, trucks started coming down the road, um, coming down from Congo, loaded down with hardwoods, yeah. and army deployed all the way along the road. And then at a certain point in the afternoon, they all disappeared, and you know, it was a sort of no-go area again. Mm. But it was quite clear that there was some sort of systematic extraction going mm. on, and the local army officers and others Mm. District officials were involved in it. Um, there's certainly been money in the north. Yeah. yeah. Another question. Yeah. yeah. It's tangential to your, yeah. to your whole talk, but I come from the medical world and I'd love to know how you got access to a traditional healer, a white man being talking to and finding out what's going on. We've never managed that. Well, it was actually, but, yeah, I mean, it, it was actually so, sort of um, almost probably you won't want to hear. It was actually quite easy. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, no, I was actually, I think, no, the reason, the reason was I went with, I was in the camp and there was a medical post run by Médecins Sans Frontières. And they have local health workers who do a sort of sweep of the camp every day, actually. They sort of walk around, they look for people with medical problems. And so they have this sort of rather uneasy coexistence because the first port of call is often the, the traditional healer. Although they have the MSF has a clinic in one part of the camp which is free, and they they um, you know there's a big queue of people who go there after the traditional healers failed. So they kind of go to the traditional healer first, and then the free MSF clinic second. And this woman who took me around was a, an Acholi lady who was who was from the you know from the area, born and bred there, but educated to a much higher level than most of the people in the camp. And and she was sort of almost probably more scathing about these healers than we would kind of would try, you know, dare to be, because it would sound very disrespectful. You know. But she was saying, you know, these, they're cheating, these women. You know, these women are being cheated. And, and, and look, isn't it awful? But, you know, she knocked on the door, and I came in, and she was made very welcome. And I saw the winnowing and the ritual. And it, I think I mean, it, was, it was having, I mean, if I'd wandered in on my own without her as an escort, it wouldn't have happened. But with her as a sort of sort of m rather matronly figure in the camp uh, was quite easy. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that what you saw was an Ajwaka. So right. was a very particular kind of traditional healer. I mean, the Acholi, the, the, if you like, the orthodox Acholi traditional healers are associated with lineage shrines and controlled by, um, by, by men, usually, male elders. And the Ajwaki, just like, like such a, a woman as, um, as Matt met, um, are possessed by wild spirits, not by the spirits of ancestors, but by, by, by wild spirits from the bush. And so they're often the ones that are consulted about things that don't make sense. Um, and Ajwaka is possessed by the bush. So you know, the very word for the LRA, the bush, is in the possession of the Ajwaka. Um, and it, you know, it's very interesting going, going to that region now because you know, I first went there in the 90, early 1980s. And in the evening in Gulu in the early 1980s, you'd hear ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum And you'd go out to the drums, and it would be a seance, and there would be a juaka performing seance rituals, which you could participate in. Now it's all gone undercover. So people will say, oh, no, we don't have Ojwaki anymore. But of course, as, as you found out, you go to a camp and say, take me to your Ojwaka, and they take you there straight away. <laughs> yeah. But they, don't, they no longer use drums. They now do it very silently, because Alice Laquena and Joseph Connie were targeting them, because they had been Ojwaki themselves. And so they saw other Ojwaki as, um, as competition 
and uh, the Holy Spirit movement and the LRA have targeted such people and killed them. Um, so now they're a bit secretive. Mm. But it's not, a, it's not difficult meeting local healers in northern Uganda. Um, go there and ask for one and they'll show you lots. <laughs> they'll rustle <laughs> <them out> really <laughs> fast. <laughs> and it goes on in the churches all the time too, laying on of hands and so on. Yeah, another question. Yeah. I, I was wondering, um, did Kony ever really want to be a political leader or was he happy just being a military figure? And did he give any specifics about how he plans to run Uganda um, under the Ten Commandments? Well, that, that is actually a very good question about what his personal ambition was, um, and, and one that was very hard to figure out. And I think what, what, what he would talk about, he did talk about the Ten Commandments. I mean, he, he, it's, not, it's not incorrect, but in a sense that was a very small part of what he was talking about. And what he would try to articulate in the speeches to his followers that, that were sort of relayed back to me sort of... Um, later was that he, he was he was playing to all the a sense of grievance in in Acholi land you know we've talked a bit about how when the w when Museveni took power people in Acholi felt afraid that the new government was going to take revenge and he would point to the camps and say look the government is planning to take your land he, he would refer to the theft of cattle which was something that we didn't talk about but just after Museveni took over huge, and basically all the cattle in Acholi were stolen with the collusion of army officers, of Museveni's army officers, a complete economic disaster. Even now, Joseph Kony talks about wanting compensation for the cattle. So he's pressing buttons that are very deep within the Acholi consciousness. He's talking <coughs> about things that really Acholi people get upset about. So he's not simply a spiritual guru. I mean, he talks about very real-world, political, economic issues. Um, but of course, that's, he, they've never, he's projected that within the group, but he's never done a very good job of projecting it outside the group. Um, Do you think also that he's become more secular in his orientation as part of the peace process? It's very difficult to have a peace process when you're talking about anointing the president with oil. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if that's the case. I mean, because when, when we saw him in the clearing, he, he gave a speech to elders in a kind of, almost, they'd almost built in the bush a sort of, it was almost like a Viking parliament. It kind of was made out of sort of logs of wood and wicker almost. I mean, it looked sort of almost like a, a kind of historic construction. And he was in this parliament with the elders, and then he really came to life. He looked like he was in his element. He was expounding in a trolley, his sort of, this very sort of powerful voice going through the clearing. And he, we could hear a translation. He was talking about Ten Commandments. Mm. Um, so it's not a myth that he talks about that, but he was also talking about, you know, restoring a trolley dignity, and, and he was talking about cattle, and, and he was talking about, you know, bread, what we would call bread and butter issues. Um, in a suit, it, with a haircut, well, yeah. which is quite interesting, wasn't it? Because <laughs> no, that wasn't how anybody expected him. No, so indeed, it. indeed. Um, you know, he came, you know, he, 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 we sort of expected someone in a dress or something, you know, some just bizarre, you know, outfit, but in fact, you know, he looked quite normal. Because well. the early images of him were with, yeah. you know, a Rastafarian haircut and things, and yeah. looking very wild. It, it, it's also interesting to you know, approach it another, from another direction. The, um, you know, of course, there are, there are many people in Gulu and elsewhere who you can talk to who, who were with him for a long time in the bush, including his wives. And you know, what they would say is that he's a very decent, mm. nice person, and he has no control over the spirits. So the spirits will seize him, and then he's someone completely different. Mm. Mm. And um, yeah, they speak very fondly of him. They, you know, they say he was very kind to children. Yeah, very kind. But then when the spirit always, takes yeah. him, you don't know which one it is. You know yeah. what the spirit's <laughs> going to tell him to do. Um, and so they, they, they would make that distinction very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that. Yeah. Well, you could say schizophrenic. Someone's saying schizophrenic in the front. Certainly, there's a. But it's also true with Ajwaki, that you meet an Ajwaki, like the one that you met, who can be a real sweetie pie, and then she becomes possessed. And what possessed Ajwaki say and do is quite different. And they will then say they don't remember it when they, mm. um, when they return to consciousness. Yeah. It's a slightly negative question, but um, there's talk that the war in Sudan may start again if the peace process doesn't work out. If that happened, would that also become his position substantially, and if so, how? That, that, that's a very good question, because 
part of the reason why this peace process has started is because of what's happened in Sudan. Just to sort of recap, Sudan's obviously north of Uganda. For a long time, there was a north-south civil war for about 20 years, the south fighting for more autonomy from the, from the government in Khartoum. There's also another conflict, obviously, in Darfur, which is a whole different thing. But that war between the north and south ended with a peace deal in 2005. And that was really the moment where the clock began ticking for Kony, because for a long time, he'd been a player in that war. And he'd been useful to Khartoum because he was fighting on their behalf. Suddenly, it was OK, the, the, the strategic map had changed. Um, and one of the main reasons why he had to flee was because suddenly there was a government, a very embryonic government, but a, a, the rebel movement had now become the government. They were trying to assert control. They wanted to get Ugandan troops out. They wanted to get Kony out. They wanted to just get control of their territory. But like you say, there's a lot of tension still between Khartoum and the south of Sudan. And there's a fear that, for example, if that peace agreement between north and south breaks down, all bets are off in a sense. Suddenly, Kony becomes useful again. Um, so I think, I think that's the big hidden risk. Um, that, and, and there have been more alarming signs in recent months, reports of attempted coups in the South, um, the South getting increasingly angry that Khartoum isn't sticking to the key points in the peace agreement. It's, it's a very fragile deal. Uh, and you know, South Sudan has been at war for what? I don't know, 40 out of 50 years or, or thereabouts. So, if it did, if that war does restart in five five years, yeah, certainly Kony's Kony's chances suddenly Kony suddenly gets going to get out of jail free card. I think there's another factor here which is worth bearing in mind that the you know the the, the current war in Sudan what broke out in 1983, not actually triggered by the imposition of Sharia law on the south but because of a division in the Southern Regional Assembly between um, factions that had a power base in Western Equatoria among the Zandi and, um, and the faction that had its power base around Bor, where the SPLA were, was established. And you know, the trigger for the, for the war was when the Bor cattle merchants were expelled from Juba Market by um, Joseph James Tumbera of Zandi when he became president of the Southern Region. And the LRA um, have been in Zandi land, and they've been developing a relationship mm. with local Zandi. And I think they were sort of imagining that possibly if there's going to be an independent southern Sudan, there's going to be a war between that area of southern Sudan and central southern Sudan, and they're going to be involved in it, mm. operating with the Zandi. And they weren't abducting anybody in Zandi land, and they had quite a cozy relationship when I was there a year or so ago with the local Zandi people. So uh, you know, I think there's that side to it too. Um, but whether that's going to play out like that now that they're kind of being pushed across the border, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yes. Um, two observations, not, not really questions, but I, I think it's very difficult, and I'm sure being much more aware of the situation than I am, um, you'd agree there are huge cultural boundaries. And I think one of the wisest things that's been said tonight is your observation that when it comes to talking about spirits and the spirit world, we can't comment and we can't even claim to have an understanding and I think we have to be very careful that that lack of understanding doesn't become presented as an assumption of superiority over the issue or as an assumption that the issue isn't an important one or is one that we can be um, satirical about because we don't understand it and I think it's an incredibly important issue that is a, a real barrier to us or anyone involved in any of the issues where spirituality in Africa is involved, having the full understanding. And I think we have to be very careful about not not being too satirical and not bypassing that and trying to gain or claim an understanding of the whole issue without having that come to one side. And, and there's a certain colonial aspect to trying to roll over that and claim an understanding without it. And on the same effort, and I, I hope this doesn't come across as too critical, but the, the, the superiority assumed in discussions about people profiteering from the war is quite a difficult one, when both gentlemen have published books and, and presumably not just on a kind of social profit on, and, a, and a rise in social aspect, but also to some small degree, depending on sales, the financial profit has resulted because of that. And so all of us, all of us find ourselves in a position sometimes when when we ourselves, if we're involved in issues in Africa, are profiting from this, not in the same way, and certainly not with the same motive, but with the same outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm guilty. You're right. No, you're right. I mean, I think I think what I was, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of people who profit, not just uh, not just soldiers, not just rebels. You know, we talked a bit about the aid agencies. I mean, journalists too. You know, we've all kind of gone and eaten at the the buffet and the Acholi Inn. So we've all, we, yeah. I mean, we've all been involved in that. So. Addressing the moral superiority of yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have to take some, just the last questions. Yes? Let me take one or two together sure. now, sure, because can it's... I, can I make a comment? Yeah. I also am a journalist. You kind of remember, I write about... Um, Where's that voice coming from? Oh, yeah, over there. <laughs> I would completely disagree with you. I think one of the problems is that because people don't want to talk about spirituality, they don't want to be accused of, like, talking about witchcraft in Africa. Um, they don't write about it at all, and therefore what you end up is with one-line references to don't address the key issues in Africa at all. Um, just as we don't address ethnicity being an issue, we don't address spirituality as being an issue. And but because everyone is being so co-faced and very kind of like worthy about this coverage, we don't actually ever address these issues. So we don't write about these stories at all. And if Uganda has been under-reported in the North, as is most of Africa, in my view, it is under-reported repeatedly, it's because people do not dare to venture into this territory and, as a result, really important wars and civil conflicts simply don't get covered. So I completely disagree with you, and I think that the po-face coverage of the British media and the African media, which doesn't also want to address these issues, is one of the key problems with the coverage of Africa. And on the last issue, I also have written books about Africa, so I can tell you that these two gentlemen are not making very much money. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I make a third of amount, the amount of money I used to earn as a journalist from book writing in Africa. So usually somebody who decides to write a book about Africa is actually making an economic sacrifice. It's very hard to write a book. <laughs> um, you know, books take a long time. They take several years to write. They take a lot of worthy on-the-ground research. Uh, during which time, some like Matthew, some like Tim, could be earning a decent amount of salary working for an academic organization, or a newspaper, or a bank, or an NGO. <laughs> and they'd be earning more than writing a book. So I don't wish, I think there's no point exaggerating how much money books make. And, you know, the head of the army who runs this buffet in that hotel will be making a lot more money than he would have Matthew here today. And of course, I'm talking from a Totally personal perspective, <laughs> but I just wanted to make this point. Thank you. Um, thank you for that robust defense. I, I do think that there is a point, though, about the difficulty of grappling with spiritual issues. And um, I think you're both right in a sense. I mean, we're talking about a world in which etiologies of suffering are very different. And in a way, I would say one can't really understand the LRA without recognizing that that when people understand misfortune and suffering in interpersonal terms, it leads to different understandings of the spirit world and different kinds of political movements. And for me, that's the best way of seeing where the LRA and the Holy Spirit movement have come from. There's one over there. Yeah. Is that the last question? But there's other people with their hand up. There's, I'm gonna th can I take all three? Is it just three? Three together. Four, is that, was that half a hand? No, you've already had a go. Three, and then maybe Matt can do a masterful summing up. I thought you were supposed to do that. No, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, my question, I think, quite helpfully derives from the two previous comments, which I know were opposed, but both very interesting. Um, my aunt spent a long period of her maiden aunt life working in northern Uganda for absolutely no profit, and in fact, in that respect, represented to be like a very extreme version of what uh, the lady who, who writes books on Africa commented on. She um, worked uh, as a teacher uh, in the 50s and early 60s, and later in her life, before she died, reflected very sadly on what had happened in <laughs> northern Uganda. My, my question is, was she doing terrible things that later led to the sort of ghastly um, situation that's since largely prevailed in the north? Or was she delaying something which would have happened sooner had there not been that extremely conscientious approach to education going on with people who were extremely self-sacrificial in the way they went about it, wherever that was? And were the seeds of this awful terror 
there long, long ago, I mean, long before uh, colonial influence began. Should we take three together? Yeah. And then have a last discussion? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you mentioned in your book uh, that at the time that you finally managed to speak to Con, he only spent about five minutes. Um, and he had very few things to say. Uh, you were saying just now that he has issues, but he has problems articulating them well so that the people out there can actually understand what his problems are. But you also said that there are, he's got people or maybe advisors, some of whom would come all the way from the UK. I was just wondering whether these advisors are not able to probably talk to him so that he's able to articulate the, uh, those points. And also, do you think the fact that he's not able to articulate this point well has something to do with the lack of education since he actually um, went into the bush at the early age? From a mission school. Um, okay, I, I guess I have a kind of a two point, uh, two part question. The first part being, um, I was wondering if the problem with the coverage of Africa is not so much that um, people, uh, sorry, the problem with the coverage of Africa is, is that it's boiled down to tribalism and um, uh, a backward spirituality, a scream from the swap or, or where rather than the people are, are, are ignoring the issue of ethnicity, it's that they don't see anything other than ethnicity in African debates. Um, this, the um, second question would be, I worry that we're a bit um, uncharitable when discussing aid agencies, in particular um, the World Food, Food Breaker Program, without knowing enough about the specifics. If we don't think that the Ugandan government was uh, genocidal in its intentions in setting up the camps, or even, um, um, I don't know, um, had, had negative intentions, rather it was some kind of uh, negligence, then what else was the World Food Program meant to do other than feed people? You know, I mean, if you were to ask the people in the camps, what would they rather, I'm sure, would be that they, the World Food Pro Programme continues, continued as it, as it had been. Thank you. Yeah. Go on, three questions. Let's, uh, well, let's sum up quickly then. I think, let's go backwards from the last one. No, you're right. It, it's a dilemma. I suppose with the World Food Programme, it's, it's not a, a simple question of yes or no, do we feed these people or let them starve, you know. It, it, I suppose what I'm trying to say is, though, from my own sort of naive point of view, I didn't realize how politicized these questions were. And I think that maybe almost brings us to the other point. All these interventions are, are often um, motivated by very meritorious goals. Um, they're motivated often by altruism, and that can't be a bad thing. Now, I don't know what your aunt was, was doing exactly in northern Uganda, so I, I wouldn't want to be uh, understood as sort of blanketly condemning NGOs or the UN or, or any of these uh, these kinds of activities. It's just simply they often have unforeseen consequences and those consequences are often things we're not geared up to anticipate. Um, so that, that would be my answer on that one. Um, on, on Joseph Kony's education, um, it almost goes to the other point as well. Were the seeds of this thing sown a long time ago? Um, he he was he wasn't uh, he was very articulate in his own universe but he wasn't able to to articulate that in a sort of wider sense now i wouldn't like to be read as if i'm saying that he necessarily does have a sort of worthy agenda that that you know he's legitimately pursuing i think you know he's very much twisted and corrupted those grievances um, and i think that will be for for me the most important point to make he I'm not trying to paint him as a sort of legitimate uh, representative of these grievances, but he has quite skillfully exploited them. Um, and going back to the very, very much bigger question you asked about the sort of long-term origins, yes, this, the, the, the roots of this go back way back before Museveni took power. They go back to the turmoil that happened in post-independence Uganda. They go back to Britain's decision to put Acholis into the army before World War II uh, and earlier. They go back to the slave raiding from southern Sudan into northern Uganda in the late 19th century, and probably back before the time there was even what we would call an Acholi community today. Um, and that's something I've, I've tried to touch on in the book, and 
hope you'll enjoy reading it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's having my first introduction to the area was doing something like what your aunt did. I went to teach in schools um, back in 1980. Um, in some ways, I think education and that, and that capacity to access the world through a remarkable capacity in English, which one finds all over the place in northern Uganda, is a huge asset for people. I mean, it, 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 it's a wonderful thing for many people in northern Uganda. I mean, it's one of the most heartening things one sees up there, isn't it? In the way that mm. you, you know, how people have a, have a world beyond the place in which they live because of that, that background. So I think probably your aunt is not responsible for what's happening <laughs> in, in Uganda any more than I was doing it a few years later. I think the issue with the aid agents is a really, is a really important one. And I think, but I think that your criticism is not so much, you know, um, they're evil or something yeah. like that. It's more, I think we share this view, that, that it, agencies working in a place like this have to negotiate their way into those places. You're not going to be able to provide relief in a place like that without negotiating with powerful people to be able to do it. And what I found very worrying, and I, I think this is really the key to your, mm. your, your key point, it was how it becomes institutionalized that the people working for the aid agencies forget what they're doing. Mm. Mm. No. I, I, I was le I mean, I was concerned about World Food Program, but I was more concerned by, say, human rights agencies um, you know, involved in dealing with children who would take children coming back from the LRA and then dump them in displacement camps that were too dangerous for them to follow them up and visit them. On a huge scale, thousands of them. I, I found that really disturbing and that they were not, they were not thinking it through, not thinking it through seriously. Um, and with Joseph Connie and his capacities, I'm not sure. You know, in those press meetings, like the one that you went to, he was floundering, mm. partly because of his English and the fact he was being thrown, you know, yeah. questions were coming at him in English. But when he's speaking a Choli, mm. or when he's speaking English quietly, mm. he can be incredibly shrewd. Mm. You know, in that, mm. you know, that interview that mm. Marika Shumeras mm. did, yeah. you know, when she pushed him, mm. and he, he turned to her and said, look, you know, are you stupid? Yeah. Know, war is violent. Everybody, yeah. there are no good people in war. Yeah, yeah. You know, in all wars, there are ter these terrible things. That's what war's like. Um, and he was very articulate, mm. I think. And, I, and that, mm. that gets lost a bit, I think. Mm. Um, mm. I mean, it's not something you really address in the book, mm. but um, he clearly knows what he's doing. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I think we've come to the end and it's been a very interesting discussion. Thanks, Matt, for answering all these questions. Um, and I think, I think that's it. What happens now? You sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just say thank you. So there are some books on sale at a discount. <laughs> <laughs> so please do, if you'd like, like me to buy one, buy some Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks.